pleased and Bimmy is very pleased to welcome back John Jackson, who spoke here a number of years ago. And he is a retired Navy captain who went on to become a senior professor at the Naval War College. And I put my reading glasses on now because his list of uh, accomplishments is pretty substantial. He holds the EA Sperry Chair of Unmanned and Robotic Systems, and he teaches in the area of national security affairs. And since 2006, 2006 he has served as the program manager for the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Reading Program. He is, in, a, in an expression, the Duke of Drones, having written a book, One Nation Under Drones, he is an expert in his field, traveled all over the world, giving presentations and consultation on security matters and other important areas. And his talk tonight is titled Drones That Fly, Swim, and Crawl. I'm very interested to hear about some of those and a little bit nervous about it, actually. Anyway, we're excited to have Professor John Jackson here. Please welcome John Jackson. Thank you very much. It's a, a real pleasure to be back. Uh, somebody told me that some of the members of uh, the Block Island Maritime Institute fly, swim, and occasionally crawl. So we'll see what, we'll see what happens here. But uh, what we're going to do is uh, spend about the next 45 minutes or so uh, talking about these unmanned systems and these robotics. It's a serious subject, but we try to have a little fun with it. So if you see anything up here that looks even vaguely humorous, smile or, uh, or uh, break a little laugh of some sort. So uh, anyway, the, uh, the hello. No. There we go. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, as you're all aware, you know, drones, robotics, and whatnot, it, it's everywhere. They're constantly in the news, both in military and civilian applications. Uh, a lot of things are being done with them commercially. Talk to some people tonight who've been involved in real estate and uh, uh, artists working uh, fo with photographs and whatnot. So there's a wide range of things that are done. My speech tonight is going to primarily look at the military aspects of things, but we will talk about the uh, the uh, civilian applications as we go forward. So, Oh, George, you'll see. Uh... I don't, I don't know. I have a finger. <clears throat> Forget robotics. <laughs> I've got the other one too, George. Anyway, so drones, is this a new idea? And what we find out usually in uh, looking at any of this stuff, not really. Uh, this is the uh, Sperry automatic airplane from 1918. Uh, in 1918, uh, right towards the end of the war, uh, you know, you were lucky to get an airplane in the air with a pilot and whatnot and go and do your mission. Well, somebody said, what if we could eliminate that pilot completely? And so with this aircraft, they would fill it full of dynamite. They would launch it into a uh, dir given direction. It would count the number of times the propeller went around. And when it got to a certain number, the propeller would stop and it would dive on its target. Okay, not exactly precision guided munition, but uh, it, it did the job and... Uh, uh, all of the war was over, they continued to do uh, development. And of course, radio control came in, so you didn't have to worry about pointing in the right direction and counting the uh, number of propeller uh, rotations and whatnot. This is a uh, model of the, uh, the aircraft that we talked about that uh, uh, currently is at the Naval War College. So that's World War I kind of era. We're not gonna go year by painful year. We're gonna jump to World War II. This is the uh, radio plane, the Denny Mike. Reginald Denny, who was an actor, I am told, uh, was in Hollywood and uh, made a lot of movies, but also had a hobbyist interest in uh, remote controlled airplanes. And he said, you know, I think these could do something more than just uh, fly around the air. So if you're a uh, gunner, a uh, cannoneer in the army, if you're shooting naval guns and whatnot, you really need to practice what you're doing. 
So the way they would often do that is they take a manned airplane and it would tow a banner called a sleeve and the gunners were told, shoot the sleeve. I say again, shoot the sleeve. Didn't always happen that way. We lost some planes and whatnot. They said, what if we could use an unmanned aircraft to, uh, as a target or to tow, tow the, uh, the sleeve? And so what they did is they created the Denny Mite and they built uh, over 7,000 of them during the, uh, the Second World War and used them very effectively. Well, there was a uh, young woman who worked for uh, Reginald Denny and uh, uh, was building drones and she was very attractive and the uh, Army Air Corps sent out somebody to take some pictures and whatnot. And they said, you know, I think maybe she could do more than, than build drones. And so that's Marilyn Monroe. So I, I kind of call that the ultimate bar bet, you know, how did Marilyn Monroe get her start building drones, okay? Now, I've heard a vicious rumor that Lady Gaga is getting into the drone business. And if that's true, I'm getting out of the drone business. But no offense, uh, Lady. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about aerial systems, ground systems, maritime systems. And we'll go fairly quickly with these so we have time for questions at the end. If you can hold your questions till the end, that'd probably be a little more uh, effective for us. So let's start with the big guys. And this is the RQ-4 Global Hawk. And this is strictly a surveillance aircraft, does not carry any weapons of any sort. Normally operated at a Beale Air Force Base in, uh, in California. And it has a uh, endurance that allow you basically to fly from California to Maine, spend 12 or 14 hours looking at what's going on in Maine, and then fly home. Okay. Now, we don't actually do that mission. We go overseas and do other missions, and whatnot, but that gives you some indication. So there's no pilot on board, so these things can fly you know, 24, 36 hours or more and give you that kind of unblinking eye on whatever it's going to see. So uh, U.S. Navy said, you know, we've got an awful lot of ocean that we need to keep an eye on, and so we need something kind of like that Global Hawk. And so Navy built what they call the Triton, and you see the aircraft carrier down there. It does not take off or land on an aircraft carrier. The wings are just too big to do that. So it's a shore-based aircraft, a maritime patrol aircraft. I've talked to some folks tonight who used to fly uh, P-3s doing that mission and whatnot. So I uh, went out to California. And uh, this is me at Point Magoo. So that gives you an idea how big this thing is. Now, I know it's not obvious from where you sit, but I'm about six foot six. And so that gives you an idea. We're going to have to clear the room, I think. Anyway, so this is uh, to show that I'm six foot six. This is me and one of my fellow professors, a uh, uh, guy named uh, Lannister and whatnot. And if you look, there it is. I'm clearly six foot six and whatnot. So, so. Uh, that's the biggest, and that's strictly a, a reconnaissance aircraft. This is the uh, the Reaper, uh, an earlier version called the Predator, both kind of evil sounding names, but uh, these are unmanned aircraft and they can carry missiles, carry and fire missiles, uh, can drop bombs, and have been used very, very effectively in, uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and in other theaters. And again, the notion is uh, let's be able to observe what's going on. And the early versions were only observation. And the story is that uh, they were flying one of these uh, in Afghanistan and they saw a group of people standing around a tall gentleman in a white robe. And they said, I think that's Osama bin Laden. And by the time they got a manned aircraft with a weapon back to that location, he was gone. So the CIA, which was actually operating these things instead of the Air Force at this point in time, said, could you launch a missile from this thing? And the, uh, the manufacturers, which is an outfit called General Atomics, which sounds like something from the Jetsons or something. But anyway, General Atomics Aeronautics built these. Said, well, let's find out if we launch a missile, does it rip the wing off or are we OK? And they were able to find that, yes, indeed, it uh, is able to do that mission. Uh, the Air Force initially didn't like them too much. Any Air Force officers, people in here? Good, I can make fun of them. Uh, you know, the Air Force guys, you know, airplanes have pilots, and we're not really interested in any airplanes that don't have pilots. 
but they realized what great capacity and capability these provided. So they ultimately bought enough to have 75 predators in the air, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So 75 different locations, there was one of these unmanned aircraft to operating. And that wasn't enough to meet all the requirements, but that's as many as they could currently uh, fulfill. So uh, the home for, uh, base for most of these is Creech Air Force Base. And this is, uh, this is uh, me. Uh, the Air Force has a hole they make Navy guys stand in. So you look, so you look short by, uh, by comparison. But uh, anyway, this is a good friend of mine who's one of the commanders of the, uh, the unmanned squadron out there and whatnot. So Creech Air Force Base is kind of the home base, but these aircraft are flown in about 30 different locations, Air National Guard bases, et cetera, around the world. Now, you may be aware of the fact that, you know, the airplanes are overseas somewhere in the theater of operations. The pilots are in Creech Air Force Base outside Las Vegas or one of these other locations. So the guy in Las Vegas is flying the airplane, pushes a button to fire the missile and whatnot. He doesn't fly it from uh, the area in which they're fighting, but flies it ashore back in their own base. And that does a lot of things. It does not put the, as many people at risk. Uh, it allows you to fly. This airplane can fly for 24 hours. So three different crews, crew can sit down, fly the airplane for eight hours, Second crew comes in, third crew comes in. So again, it gives you that ability to stay over your target and engage your target. And the good thing about that is you watch the target in action. So you watch an individual and you can watch him for weeks if need be. You keep replacing the airplane and you see, hey, this guy leaves this building. He goes over here, things blow up. He apparently is a bomb maker. We think it's necessary to attack this target. They get the authorization and they do that. So <clears throat> Air Force is very careful about, you know, who they attack and when they attack. Have there been mistakes? Yes, the, you know, the, the fog of war is such that you don't always exactly know, but in 99% uh, of the case, you are aware of what you're doing. So that's, that's important. So the Navy says, okay, well, I've got this thing, the Triton. I'd like to have one that will fly off an aircraft carrier. So this is the, uh, the UKSD, which is the Unmanned Combat Air Systems Demonstrator. And to give you an idea, that's how big it is. Uh, and that's, that's me and my blue shirt, uh, which you will see again later. It's a big airplane. It's as big as an F-18. It wings fold up to go on the aircraft carrier. It launched and recovered on numerous occasions. It was only a demonstrator. It was never intended to be an operational aircraft, but it was very successful taking off, landing, uh, and doing the missions that it needed to do. And it always also was able to do air-to-air -air refueling, which is one of the most difficult things that any aviator has to do. You know, you've got to sneak up behind that tanker and plug in your uh, probe and get the fuel and whatnot. In this case, it's a manned tanker and the unmanned aircraft is, uh, is they call it passing gas, which I apologize for. It's not, not a term I uh, certainly approve of. So anyway, this is a demonstrator. Uh, Navy went on and awarded a contract for the uh, carrier-based air-to-air refueler. It's called the MQ-25 Alpha Stingray. I like that. I drive a Corvette Stingray, so I like to use this one. As you can see, it has wide, long wings. It flies a fair distance and whatnot. And its job is to take off from the carrier. When the fighters or bombers take off, they go towards the target. The refueler refuels it. They go in and do their attack mission. They come back out. The refueler refuels it and brings it back on the carrier. So it's an important job. And right now it's being done by converted fighter aircraft, which don't have the range or the, the fuel carrying capacity. So this is now in development. It's flown its first couple of missions. And we hope within two to three years, we'll actually have them operational on the, on the aircraft carriers. This is the RQ-170 Sentinel. And this is interesting because it's a stealth version. And you may have seen this one because uh, one of them were captured. One of it was one of them was captured by uh, the uh, Iranians, and the Iranians claimed they were able to hack the signal and bring it in. In reality, we think there was a communications problem, and the airplane 
went off course and landed in the desert of Iran. They went out and collected it and brought it back. Uh, we claim they really didn't get too much intel out of it and whatnot, but uh, we've now moved on to the next level. Uh, the RQ-170, if you remember the uh, bin Laden raid, when they, uh, when they uh, killed bin Laden, there was one of these aircraft overhead providing the video, and you've seen the pictures of uh, Secretary Clinton and President Obama and others watching something while they're watching the feed from this unmanned aircraft. So it gives you great ability to know what's going on on the ground. So those are kind of the bigger ones. Let's look uh, downward a bit. So this is the uh, the Marine Corps version called Blackjack. And again, to get an indication of the size, uh, that's me with the, uh, with the Blackjack. <clears throat> now I went to a conference and I took these pictures. I came back and my boss said, okay, apparently you spent one day at the conference, took all these pictures wearing a blue shirt and then went and played golf. So. <laughs> The moral of the story is change your shirt between uh, various pictures and whatnot. But the blackjack will launch either from a ship or will launch from shore, go up and do about uh, 12 to 18 hours worth of observation. Not armed, although they've done some uh, practice to see if it can be armed and whatnot. Marines are very fond of it. You know, the issue always is, you know, what's going on on the other side of the hill? And you don't want to have to go over there personally to check it out. You'd much rather have somebody tell you what's going on, like a drone. So they love these things that they give this uh, battlefield awareness and whatnot. And so they're very, very popular. Moving smaller yet, this is uh, the switchblade. And uh, you can see that it's uh, launching out of a compressed gas canister. Its wings and tail pop out. That's why they call it a switchblade. The uh, soldier is looking in the control uh, center and he's driving this aircraft. Now, what's interesting about this one is it carries a warhead. So it has a bomb in the front of it. And when you launch it, it's going to explode one way or the other. You don't want this one coming back <laughs> because that would be a bad day in Black Rock. So what they do is, you know, it's, it's designed to attack an automobile, a bus, a a relatively uh, not entrenched uh, facility. It's about a hand grenade size explosive and whatnot, but it gives these people that are out there walking around kind of a backpackable cruise missile that they can launch this thing, go out and attack the target. If they don't see a target that they ultimately wanna do, they will just self-destruct it and, uh, and it does not come back. So uh, this is another version of uh, uh, the Blackjack called the Blackwing. And the notion here is if you're in a submarine, you know, your periscope goes up to, you know, this height and you can see a certain number of miles around the submarine. Well, if you launch a black wing, you get about a 400 foot, 500 foot tall uh, periscope and you can see everything around you to find out if there's any ships, enemy or otherwise in the area and whatnot. There's no attempt to recover this one either. You know, the, the cost per unit is such that they just let it splash. And if you're a submarine, you don't want anybody to know where you are anyway. So you don't want to be, you know, you launch this thing and then you move and you don't want to be trying to catch it back. So very, uh, very successful. The submariners, again, love it because it gives them that kind of visibility on what's going on. This is a design uh, that's uh, really uh, brand new. And the notion here is what if you had a drone that could be a loyal wingman? They also call it an attritable, attritable aircraft. And the notion here is, say you have an F-22 or an F-35 manned aircraft flying against a target. He's got three or four of these wingmen with him. One may have sensors, one may have uh, missiles, one may have bombs. So the guy in the manned aircraft sends the sensor platform in, sees what's going on, then sends the weapons platform in never putting himself at risk or the $80 million airplane that he happens to be flying. Uh, and again, these are gonna be on the order of uh, four or $5 million. You wanna get it back, but if you don't get it back, that's kind of the cost of doing business. This is a new one called the long shot. And what this is, is a drone and the drone is carrying missiles. So instead of the missiles being under an aircraft, they're actually gonna launch this carrier, which has additional missiles on it. And so again, it extends the range of the manned aircraft. And when you're talking about Afghanistan, Iraq, those kind of things, we pretty much own the airspace. There wasn't much of a problem with, 
with enemy attack and whatnot, if you're talking about potential fighting with China, Russia, whatever uh, uh, major powers, you really need to have the capability to uh, go inland without necessarily uh, putting yourself at risk. This is called Gremlins. And the notion here is if you see that aircraft, that's a cargo aircraft. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna fly that cargo aircraft, aircraft close to the, uh, the beach, and then you're gonna send out your gremlins. The gremlins are gonna go out either with weapons or with sensors and whatnot. And the gremlins are gonna come back and they're gonna capture them in midair and winch them back inside the airplane, fuel them up and send them back out again. So, you know, the air to air refueling is pretty tricky. This is even trickier, uh, but uh, it's been done in tests and whatnot. And we think it has, uh, has potential for being able to take any cargo aircraft basically and turn it into an attack aircraft. So. This is just a, an illustration of uh, next generation swarms. The notion is, uh, you know, it, you can probably defend against one or two drones. What if you had a hundred drones coming at you at one time? Could you defend against them? And that's a very, very difficult kind of a discussion. And, you know, the good guys and the bad guys were all looking at the same kind of a situation. It says, you know, how do we get the drones swarm to the location you need? If they're small, they don't have great range. So you've got to balance out all that. But uh, swarms are uh, one of the big challenges in the unmanned business. So we talked about fixed wing aircraft, big ones all the way down to small ones. Now we'll talk about the rotary, rotary wing drones, rotary helicopters, basically. Now this guy, I think his nickname is one leg or peg leg or something, because if he's flying that thing with all those propellers going around, I don't think I'd want to be on board with him. So it's a, uh, you know, just a concept, you know, can we actually do this and, uh, and make it work? But uh, this is a kind of a number of civilian uh, folks are developing these. Not a lot of government money in it yet for that particular design. But what we do, do, do have is something called the MQHC Fire Scout. And this is a Bell 407 helicopter. And they basically have painted the, the uh, windshield gray, put in the unmanned uh, operation systems and whatnot. It flies completely unmanned. Flies off the deck of ships, flies off, uh, off land and whatnot. And uh, this gives you kind of an indication of the size, again, six foot five, uh, whatever. This is the Lockheed K-Max, and this was a program that the, the Marines developed and in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, the issue was you had these out forward base, forward operating bases, and you had to resupply them. So how do you do that? Well, you take two trucks worth of stuff and you take two trucks worth of people behind it and two trucks worth of people in front of it. They go down the road, improvised explosive devices, IEDs, were one of the uh, most damaging uh, weapons used in these uh, vicinities. So the Marines said, well, what if we didn't have to put anybody on the road at all? What if we could pick up the stuff here and fly it to that forward operating base? And that's what they did with the K-Max. The K-Max uh, weighs 6,000 pounds and can carry 6,000 pounds and totally uh, automated. Uh, they sometimes would use somebody with a laser designator on the ground saying, put the package here, and they would drop it off at the various locations. Uh, very successful. They mostly fly at night and whatnot and resupply the, uh, the forward operating bases. So will we uh, use these in the future? Army, Air Force, everybody's looking at, you know, do we have money in the budget to do unmanned cargo lift? And uh, we'll see if that develops. The uh, K-Max was originally uh, designed for uh, aerial logging. You know, if you do logging somewhere, you have to build a little haul road, you have to cut down the trees, you have to tr haul the trees out. K-Max would come and pick the tree up and take it right to where you wanted it. So uh, pretty remarkable that when, when war came along, they decided they were usable for other things. So this is a, a very interesting one. This is uh, uh, the VBAT. And the notion here is how do you get drones to launch from small ships like destroyer sized ships? The uh, helicopters we showed can do that. This can also do it. And it's a ducted fan and it'll take off straight up and then rotate over and fly horizontally for hundreds of miles, do its mission, come back, tilt up, 
and land back down. And you can see the guy standing there. They literally can reach out and grab this thing and bring it uh, exactly where you want it. So uh, it's fairly new design, but it has, has great potential for giving you that ability to have that airborne observation post where, wherever you want to go. Shrinking even smaller, this is the instant eye quad rotor. Uh, this is the Marines, and the Marines have been very innovative in terms of uh, using unmanned systems. And this is sometimes known as quads for squads. Every Marine squad will have its own drones. And so you throw them in the air, you control them uh, with a uh, device down there. And again, it gives you that ability to know what is over this hill before you have to go over there and engage it. Getting even smaller, here's the Black Hornet Nano Drone. Now, this thing looks like a toy, but it is not. And what the soldiers will do is they'll carry two of these mini helicopters on their chest in a box. They take it out, they throw it in the air, it flies for about 25 minutes, gives you infrared and uh, regular ver vision of what's going on. You bring it back and you recharge it and you send it out again. Again, the people that are using it, particularly Special Operating Forces, SEALs, uh, those kind of folks really, really like that ability to have that organic capability. Now, you know, you've got the ability to call the Air Force and say, hey, would you take one of those predators or, reader, or reapers, fly it over here and tell me what you see? Well, if they're busy, they may not come. So the Marines and these other forces, we want something we can carry with us that can do the job for us. So on the civilian side, this is, uh, this is the EHANG. UAV taxi. Now, the notion here is you would go out to the taxi, you'd open the door, you'd get in, you'd touch the uh, uh, iPad and say, take me to Block Island. It would lift off, no pilot, no parachute, just one terrified passenger, <laughs> and fly you to wherever you want to go. Uh, they've done it experimentally, uh, you know, both uh, uh, all of the uh, people who do taxi, Uber and Lyft and those guys say they need to really get away from driving around on the roads. If we could have a helicopter that you could call when you needed it, that would be a great business plan and whatnot. So a lot of work, experimentation going on. This is uh, the Volocopter, kind of an unusual design. There are rotors all the way around that outer circumference. Uh, that's me inside it uh, at the Singapore Air Show. And uh, it can fly, as we say, unmanned with no pilot, or you could fly with a pilot. But again, the notion is to be able to uh, do inner city connectivity and whatnot uh, with an unmanned aircraft. Getting smaller, here's, uh, you may have remembered this in the news in January of 2015. Uh, some guy got a drone for Christmas and got a little liquored up and said, I wonder if I could fly that over there on the White House lawn. And he did. Uh, and it really got a lot of people excited because they're very hard to detect. They're very hard to engage and whatnot. And so even though they have a lot of people watching the White House, this thing was able to get over the fence and crash land. So counter UAS, counter unmanned air system is a, is a very big business. So now this is going to be the best picture of the whole presentation. And if you want to applaud, you, you, you may do so. But uh, there it is. I call this my John Wayne, my John Wayne picture. And this is an unmanned aircraft gun to shoot these things down. It has compressed air. It has a viewfinder. You look through the viewfinder, and it finds the incoming drone. It goes beep, beep, beep. You push the button and a uh, projectile goes out to where that location is and opens up and drops a parachute and a net and brings down the drone. So that's good because you can jam these things, but that tend tends to jam everybody else's radios. And if you're in a civilian environment, it jams everybody's TV and everybody gets excited about that and whatnot. So this is uh, called Skywall. Uh, it's been used uh, uh, rather extensively protecting Air Force One and, uh, and other aircraft and whatnot. So that's the Naval War College behind me and we're out on the grass uh, shooting drones. And that was, that was about as cool as it gets. So. That was my Christmas card picture one year. Uh, my, oh, 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 was it? Was it? I, I missed that. Well, you need to pick one 
I absolutely do. So anyway, yeah, that's uh, that's my fun thing. Now this is a drone killer, and I've got a picture of me shooting that, but I, I don't want to overdo it. But this is again a jammer. So this is the idea that if somebody's controlling this thing, it's coming in towards you. If you jam it, you can either get it to go someplace else or get it to go back where it came from, regardless. Uh, but using the, the tactical uh, uh, electronics to uh, to jam the thing and kill the drone. So that's all good and well. They've also gone as far as to uh, use eagles or uh, hawks, and uh, they train them to go there and knock these things out of the sky. So the ASPCA said, well, wait a minute now. You got this thing going around, these poor birds, they got their little claws, they're gonna get hurt. So they built like little Teflon gloves <laughs> to put on these birds so they could go and do this mission. So uh, it has been used, uh, they, you know, they're very effective at what they're doing and whatnot, but it's not, uh, not something we're putting a lot of stock in right now. So, okay. So now we'll look at the maritime kind of issues. Um, we talked about the airpiece. Maritime, these are unmanned surface vessels. And the notion here is, can you have a ship that operates with no crew on board? Uh, this one is called the Sea Hunter. And it uh, was designed to operate to search for submarines and basically find a submarine and stay with it for weeks at a time. And eventually the submarine may very well surface to get rid of this guy or just because they don't want to be followed anymore. Uh, they've built two of these uh, sea hunters. Uh, they've made uh, unmanned uh, transits from San Diego to Hawaii and back. Uh, catamaran design, so they're very stable and whatnot. Uh, the Chinese have a unmanned, uncrewed surface vessel that looks painfully close to what the uh, the sea hunter looks like but uh, uh, if you can I guess if you can steal it it's uh, cheaper than uh, having to do the development we've also got uh, a program called ghost fleet overlord and what they've done is taken a uh, offshore boat that handles uh, work for offshore uh, oil rigs and whatnot and converted it to unmanned operation Sailed it all the way from Norfolk, Virginia to San Diego. Nobody on board, except during the canal. They wouldn't let them go through the canal without a pilot or somebody on board. Uh, so the Navy is very, very serious about this. We don't know exactly what we're going to use them for. There's a number of concepts uh, that you'd have a helicopter on the back end of that one. Missile launcher is here. Or you'd have this lower one here that potentially could have, you know, 100 missiles. And so you'll have a destroyer out there, which has the high end surveillance capability, and they would identify the target and tell this unmanned air, uh, ship fire in this location and whatnot. So instead of having a ship that has maybe 80 missiles on it, you could have an arsenal ship that has hundreds of missiles. So we're uh, building these things now. We're designing them to find out exactly how to operate. Any of you that have boats know are you really going to be able to send this thing off for six months with no maintenance? Probably not. Probably going to need a tender of some sort of a vehicle that will allow people to go on board and tweak this stuff as need be. But it's got great potential for, uh, for expanding the fleet. And uh, Navy's always said we need 600 ships. We have just, under, just over 300 ships, and we're probably not going to get anywhere near 600. Uh, but if you could have some of these unmanned vehicles, which are a lot cheaper to build and a lot cheaper to operate, you can meet a lot of those requirements. This is a, an unmanned cargo vessel. And again, uh, sail sailors in the audience will go, <laughs> that sounds like a hazard to navigation to me. But, you know, you could very well have this cargo ship operating and somebody sitting in London is uh, driving the ship and doing what needs to be done and whatnot. Uh, you know, there's very few crew on uh, cargo ships these days. Maybe you could take that down to zero. This is an interesting one called the Sail Drone. And uh, it is designed to go out and do missions of six to nine months at a time. It has solar powers, solar panels for energy, uh, uses the sail for energy and whatnot, and has uh, done remarkable uh, long range uh, trips. Uh, again, they've built uh, thousands of these and they're all over being used both by military and by research organizations. And I think Block Island Maritime Institute needs a sail drone. So uh, where's the president? There he is. I'll connect you with a salesman. Okay. <laughs> 
There is a special, that's right. There's always a special on it. So uh, that's, we'll talk about a little bit about unmanned surface vehicles or unmanned undersea vehicles. This is a design that just basically says there's lots of different kinds and lots of different sizes and whatnot. I won't try to go through that. This is a, a version of uh, some of the sea gliders. Some of them, as you can see, uh, arrayed here, uh, just go out and and again, they can go out for months, six months, nine months at a time. And they'll go out and they'll sink. And then they'll come back up to the surface, send out a report of what it saw. It'll sink again. And it just does that continuously across the, uh, across the oceans. So very, uh, very effective. And some of these other ones are bigger ones, which uh, you know need to be launched by ships. Some of them are tethered, and so you have to keep them hooked to the ship all the time. The truly unmanned undersea vehicles are the ones that will swim unaccompanied. And you've seen those uh, operate in a lot of places to find World War II sunken ships and find airplanes that have crashed and recover the, uh, the black boxes and whatnot. My favorite of all of these is the, uh, the Orca, the Echo Voyager. This is an unmanned submarine. And give you an idea of the size, it's 80 feet long, about eight to 10 feet in diameter. It can dive to 11,000 feet depth of water. Not 1,100, 11,000 feet depth of water. And they built it with aluminum uh, pressure structures inside. So the hull is actually free flooded, but those aluminum pressure uh, vessels have all the electronics in it. If they made those pressure vessels out of titanium, you can go down to better than 18,000 feet, which is pretty much as deep as anywhere in the Marianas Trench or anywhere else you want to go. So this is me at the, uh, the launching of the whole thing. And I didn't have my blue shirt, so I added it digitally uh, just to keep with the, uh, keep, keep with the theory here. Um, again, uh, that's an idea of how big this thing is. So. That's a 34 foot uh, section, which is a payload section. So what do you do with it? Uh, you could launch missiles out of the top. You could launch UAVs out of the top. You could launch uh, mines out of the bottom. You could have uh, seals swim out of it, not from 11,000 feet. <laughs> Shallow water swimmers could swim out of there. So this is built by Boeing. Uh, the U.S. Navy has just placed an order for six of these. There's a great deal of interest from the oil and gas industry for uh, pipeline surveillance, laying pipeline, uh, uh, undersea cables and whatnot. So uh, we think there's great potential to build a lot more of these, both for military and civilian applications. And the U.S. Navy position is I'd like to have as many out there and the bad guys won't know if it's U.S. Navy or Gulf, Gulf oil, you know. And so I think we'll see them a lot of interest in the overseas market again with these. So we'll jump uh, quickly here. So we have some time for questions to uh, ground vehicles. This is kind of an unmanned tank. Uh, this thing is uh, incredibly fast, goes about 35 to 40 uh, miles an hour on the ground and in an experimental mode. This is what we're kind of more familiar with. This is the PackBot. So this is a uh, explosive ordnance disposal robot. You know, the old days you'd put on a bomb suit and you'd go down there and you'd say, you know, is this a bomb or not and whatnot. Not a good thing to do. Now you send the robot. The robot goes down there, looks at what's going on, sends the pictures back. If you decide you need to blow it up, it leaves a charge and then it pulls back and they destroy the IED. So uh, the explosive ordnance disposal people love these tremendously because it's saved hundreds if not thousands of lives. Police also are using them. You know, uh, you know they use some of these at the uh, the uh, the uh, Boston Marathon bomber and whatnot. They use one of these to look inside the uh, the boat that one of them was hiding in. This is uh, called the Mars, the Modular Advanced Armed Robotics System, and it's a little mini tank that has a machine gun, has a uh, tear gas dispenser, has a laser dazzler, has a microphone and a speaker. So you can roll up in some place and say, if you don't clear this area, we're going to engage the target. Uh, very, very significant capability. Uh, one on the side there is Admiral Christensen, the former president of the War College. And the day I told to get base security, I was bringing a robot with a machine gun. 
they said, come talk to me. <laughs> they said, don't worry, we're not bringing any bullets. It's just the, uh, the sample. But there's a lot of different designs. This is the multi-utility tactical transport, the MUT. And what people don't realize is an army soldier, a Marine and whatnot, when he's got his whole pack and whatnot, is carrying more weight than a knight in armor used to carry going into battle. So we take these men and women and we pack them up and we send them out to fight. It's hot, they're tired, it's heavy. So the idea is what if we had some kind of robotic system that would go with them, carry some of their weapons, maybe carry a gun like this one is shown here. I'm not sure this guy trusts this one. <laughs> He's kind of got his gun pointed at uh, and don't try anything. This is uh, just some more of the unmanned uh, surface vehicles that we're talking about. Large to small. This one here is called a throw bot. You throw it through the window and it sends back pictures of what's going on inside that building. They found that when you throw it through the window, the bad guys think it's going to blow up and they run out, which is okay. That's good too. Uh, then you go collect it and you use it again. Throw it over a fence, whatever, throw it over a wall, whatever you need to do. So uh, again, let's protect the soldiers and much as possible. This is Boston Dynamic. Uh, you know, we say you've seen so many movies throughout your life that robots can just walk and talk and do all kinds of things. Well, that's really hard to do. Just to get them to walk is a very difficult thing. Boston Dynamics has done uh, tremendous work with uh, both ones that are like a, uh, a robotic mule to robotic dogs to humanoid that can actually walk and do what they need to do. I, I don't have this clip, but uh, if you uh, go to YouTube and go for Atlas, uh, it's a great video of this guy with a hockey puck and the robot picks up that box and the guy with a hockey puck knocks it out of his hand. The robot picks it up, the guy knocks it out of his hand. And you can see the robot looking at him like, I'm gonna remember you. <laughs> and when we take over, you're the first guy to go. But uh, Again, they're doing, doing marvelous work and uh, you may have seen them dancing and whatnot uh, just to show the capabilities. Uh, this is uh, my elective course. So you can see a number of the, uh, my, I've got my foot on a big round one, which rolls around, has cameras on either side, can roll, can swim through the water, roll up on the beach, see what's going on. A littler version of the one with the ball, uh, the one with the gun that I talked about and others. So uh, we, go out when these guys bring them to the college. We don't do battle bots, but we, uh, we beat them up a little bit. All right, let's talk briefly about the civilian use driverless cars. <clears throat> a lot of discussion. These two people in the back seat cruising around is not really what we had in mind. Uh, as you're aware, Tesla uh, has a self-driving version, but they're very clear to say, it doesn't mean you can get in the back seat. It does not mean you can go to sleep. Uh, in fact, their latest version of their software, Elon Musk said, uh, this car may very well do the wrong thing at the worst possible time. But if you want to buy my car <laughs> and you want to pay for my self-driving thing, uh, so, you know, it's still in an experimental state. And there have been a number of crashes. People have been, ki been killed. They found one guy was watching a Harry Potter video while the car was driving down the road. A uh, truck pulled in front of them. The sensor couldn't tell the difference between the white truck and the white sky and drove right into the truck. So they tell you, you need to be ready to take control of that at any point. Will we get to the point where you can uh, you know, say, uh, take me to Chicago? Yeah, uh, at some point we will, but right now it's not there and, uh, and people should be careful what they're doing. Uh, a lot of uses, civilian uses. This is called uh, a zip line. And what this is, is operated a lot in uh, Africa. Uh, the roads, structures, and whatnot in Africa, particularly in the bad weather and whatnot, are, are almost impassable. So they will take uh, medical supplies, vaccine, whatever. They'll put it in this drone and they'll shoot it off. It goes to wherever you want it. It opens its bomb bay, drops it down by parachute, comes back and gets another load. And they have moved uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds of, uh, of material using zip line mostly overseas because the FAA has still got a lot of concerns about where these drones are going to be flying. And since I fly commercial airplanes, I, I like that idea, but uh, you know, they need to figure out how these can be used safely in the national airspace. Uh, they're used to move uh, defibrillators around. One of the big applications is precision agriculture. 
notion here is a farmer can fly his drone over there and he can detect uh, insects here, dryness here, et cetera. And then he can go and spray or uh, arrange his, uh, his irrigation. Google Air uh, has a, uh, a version they're talking about. Those are rotors on the top of the, uh, the drone, which will let it go up and down. And then they lower this package onto your front lawn. They've even patented the notion for a, a flying warehouse. So this shows you're at a football game and you want a t-shirt, so you call them up. It comes out of the, uh, the warehouse and drops in your lap. Why that's better than going down to the concession stand, I don't quite know, but anyway. So we've seen robots that fly, swim, and crawl. To learn more, uh, my book, One Nation Under Drones, the, this, those are my pasty white feet. And I'm at the top of the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. And that's the infinity pool that you go to the edge and it's, you know, 300 feet down. Uh, but that, uh, anyway, we've got a couple of books in the back, I think, if you're interested. And uh, they're also available online everywhere. So, okay, questions. Yes, sir. Now that the, the data link is is a real uh, uh, problem area, both militarily and on the civilian side and whatnot. Uh, there's a lot of rules FAA is trying to work out. If if you see a drone flying over your house and you shoot at it, you're in trouble because the FAA says that's an aircraft and you can't shoot at aircraft. Aircraft. Uh, the military is able to encrypt and to harden our systems so that they're more jammer tolerant, if you will, but that's expensive and it, it adds weight and whatnot. So what the ultimate answer is, is that these things become so autonomous that you give them a mission and they execute the mission and they come back without any mid-course guidance at all. And the, the artificial intelligence, the AI capability is, is growing to the point where they can do that. But uh, you're absolutely right that uh, you know, if you cut the link, you kill the drone. And so that's, that's an issue, both civilian side, military side, or everywhere else. So. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there are uh, there are currently drones that'll fly on uh, on uh, propane gas and other alternatives, but that's still a fossil fuel. These are all mostly electric. Uh, the smaller ones are electrical, but again, you've got to get that electricity somewhere. So, is it uh, turbines going around out here or what? But uh, there is a, a lot of work being done. Nuclear, you know, that unmanned submarine that I showed you you know, can go out uh, on fuel cells for about uh, 90 to 180 days, depending on what it's doing. You put a reactor in there, a fuel cell, a reactor in there, it can go almost indefinitely. But the U.S. isn't willing to have a, a nuke reactor wandering around in the ocean by itself. So they basically have said, we're not playing the nuke game, although it would be very easy. And you know, if you look at the stuff that's on Mars today, that's be a nuclear reactor is being used to propel that. And so, you know, it's certainly doable, but the Soviets, the Russians, and the Chinese have unmanned submarines with reactors aboard. So uh, that's concerning to us, but regulatory reasons, and we're not, we're not, we're not going to do that. Yes, sir. Yeah, they are uh, they're turbo turbo prop in the case of the pre Reaper and the uh, 
uh, Predator. The uh, others are actually a, a jet engine, a tur turbofan engine on the, uh, the Triton and those and whatnot. And so they're very efficient. Uh, the uh, one version of the uh, called the Scan Eagle will fly for 24 hours on a pint and a half of gas. It's a converted weed whacker engine, literally. And they fire this thing up and it just uses such a little bit of gas that it uh, stays out there. But, you know, it, it's always a trade-off. How big is it going to be? How fast is it going to go? And what kind of fuel are you going to use? And so you have to balance all of those as to what the mission is going to be. But the ones that are going to fly off the carrier, those are jet engines, just like the F-18s are, are going to fly. So, yes, ma'am. This is really fascinating stuff. Thank you. No, basically there's one operator usually, and if you've seen you know, some of these things that are done at football games and at the Olympics and whatnot, where they fly and they make all kinds of designs and whatnot, there's basically, it's all pre-programmed. And there's one person that pushes the button. The vehicles are able to find their space, you know, through GPS and whatnot, know where they are so they don't collide and whatnot. So it's it's pretty remarkable capability. Yeah, you know, they're studying how do birds do this and whatnot so that they can, can fly these things uh, in large size swarms. But uh, uh, the the capability is there. And again, it's a case of you know what do you want to use these things for. Do you want to just, if you've got an aircraft carrier, you don't have to sink the aircraft carrier. If you destroy all its antenna, they can't do what they need to do. If you put a few holes in the deck, they can't do what they need to do. So the, uh, the, the swarms are, are very, very concerning to us. Other question? Yes, sir. Yeah, they are all very interested. I mean, they've used drones to deliver pizzas and to deliver burritos and, and all kinds of things and whatnot. The, the big issue, again, is the FAA and what we're going to do. You know, how many do you want to say anything from zero to 200 feet is kind of drone territory and you can operate in that fine. Above that 400 to 600 feet is a certain regime. Above that is another set of rules and whatnot. We don't have that stuff in, in place at this point. So a lot of the stuff that you're seeing done is being done experimentally. And so, as you say, uh, Google and others, Amazon are all looking at this. And, you know, I don't know, I do, do I need my book from Amazon so bad it, I need it dropped on my front porch in 30 minutes. I don't know, but, uh, but they believe there's a tremendous uh, potential out there once they can work out the regulatory issues and the safety issues, because, you know, we've, we've seen uh, uh, commercial airline pilots reporting that, hey, we're coming in for landing and a drone just passed us. You know, a bird strike and an engine can knock down an aircraft. A drone can do the same thing. So they've got to be very careful what they're doing. A lot of these uh, drones are built with geofencing, which means they will not fly into an area that has been described as a no-fly area. So around a given airport, that's a no-fly area. And most of these drones will not go in there. You can't force them to go in there. They will turn and go out. Now there's others, you know, the bad guys can tweak the electronics and if they want to go in there and uh, do something they shouldn't, we not, cannot necessarily uh, stop them. But you're required to register your unmanned drones uh, with the FAA. I've got one that I fly around a little bit and whatnot. So it's registered, but the question always is, who does it belong to? And can you find the, uh, the guilty party at the right time? So, now at this point, uh, you know, they do have versions of these unmanned undersea vehicles, but they're, you have to give up X number of torpedoes in order to carry some of these unmanned vehicles. And usually they are still kind of a surveillance kind of thing that you're gonna use. And most of the submarine skippers 
they don't want to give up anything that you know is, is a weapon. So uh, it's difficult to get them to do it. Some of the submarines are now deck loading these things on their the back of the submarine, which makes a little turbulence and a little noise, which is not good. But like everything else, trade offs as to what you're trying to do. Yes, ma'am. It really varies. It, it really varies in some places are much more open than we are. Others are, are absolutely closed more so than we are. So, uh, you know, the, the Brits are pretty tight about what goes on in their airspace. Uh, some of the other countries, not so much. So it's, there is a lot of international discussions going on. There's a, a group called the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots, which says, you know, I'm not sure I want the Terminator ringing my doorbell and shooting me or something. And some real high-end folks, as Stephen Hawking was part of that uh, initiative before he died and whatnot. So there's a lot of people looking at, you know, what are the negative aspects of these things or maybe the unexpected consequences. So, yes, sir. It's more taking them out of the combat theater because in fact, uh, operating an unmanned system usually takes more people than to do a manned system. Uh, they claim that it took about 160 people to fly that Predator Reaper mission to strike somebody because you've got to have the operator, the sensor operator, the maintainer, the trainer, all the things that go with that. The intelligence is a huge piece of it because if you send this thing out and it flies for 30 hours and sends back 30 hours of real-time full motion video, who's gonna look at all that stuff? So the Intel piece is, is very significant. They're moving toward making a lot of those Intel decisions on board the aircraft. And you say, don't send me ocean top. You know, only let me know if you see something that looks suspicious. But, uh, but the real issue I think is more uh, uh, keeping the uh, soldier out of the battlefield. Uh, and if you can do that, I, I think that's the right thing to do. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I wouldn't want to be the person that said, we decided not to use drones and your son was killed. Uh, you know, but we didn't think we should use a robot. I don't want to have to have that conversation. So. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Coast Guard. I love the Coast Guard. Uh, they do more with less than anybody I can think of. Uh, they are trying to look at these unmanned helicopters uh, to put on their cutters to extend their uh, visual range. There are a number of people that are using uh, drones to fly buoys out to people who are drowning and whatnot. So uh, they, they are being used in, the, in that application and whatnot. So. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I'm sure if there's some additional questions,